about the situation of the refugees and mm -hmm. the homeless people here in Hong Kong. So um, I came here to work with the um, with the homeless people and the refugees mm -hmm. to build products out of um, free resources like garbage that with them to help them with their problems. Uh -huh. So I had the opportunity to learn about the situation of the refugees and mm -hmm. the homeless people here in uh -huh. Hong Kong and, after, and through the cooperation with the Maker Bay, the uh, Justice Alliance and the Street Sleeper Alliance I was able to uh, to really understand all of their problems in detail and given the temperature like it was the coldest winter in 60 years I decided to work with the homeless people and the refugees to build a shelter and a little heater as well as some modular furniture that will help them to um, yeah, cope with the temperatures and maybe get some privacies uh, given that many of the refugees and the homeless, as the name says, they sleep outside under the bridge and they're really, really cold. So I hope that will help them to um, keep warm and also these things are so simple to build with the resources that are at their disposal that maybe the idea catches on and they'll be able to, um, to pass the idea on. Excellent. So can you be uh, specific and tell about like specific projects that you have done? Sure. Um, so when it was announced that it's gonna get really cold, I started to um, to cut up some some tin cans to produce kind of this heater design, and then I uh, went with the um, street sleeper action committee to the homeless people and gave this to them, and they started to um, to put some wood and some paper in here and started to get the fire going, but given that it was raining a lot, most of it was really damp and wet. Mm. So they couldn't really actually start the fire. So in the middle of the night, we got the tools out and started to put air holes on the side, on the bottom, in order for once you have a fire started, it gets really, really hot and it draws a lot of oxygen much quicker. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, and so we, we basically altered the design on the spot with the community that needed it most. Mm -hmm. And they were really happy with the design as was I and they were hopefully able to spend the nights with a little bit more heat than they would usually have. So this is, uh, what is the way they normally uh, warm themselves? It's really difficult for them. So they, what they usually do is that they um, put up makeshift shelters using pallets and mm -hmm. plastic foil, and they try to get as much textile as they can to cover themselves. And this in combination with drugs is what they use to keep warm. I see. Is there, so there's no fire involved normally? Uh, normally uh, not because it's very difficult for them to have an open fire because people call the police. Uh -huh. And as well, the traditional fire, um, it basically it doesn't really heat the surrounding. Most of the heat just goes up into the air. Mm -hmm. And this in combination with a lot of wind, which is under the bridge, doesn't really make it very practical for them to use fire. But giving this design, most of the heat goes into the tin can. Mm -hmm. So it's actually the metal that radiates the heat I see. and that makes it um, makes it a bit warmer and as well it's protected against the uh, wind mm -hmm. and um, and it's kind of easy for them to put the fire out if it gets too big or mm -hmm. if the police is coming. So this design is a lot more helpful than what they traditionally use to keep themselves warm. That's okay. And so you invented the design or it's something that existed from before? No, no, it's, um, um, I'm not really an inventor as such, uh -huh. I just hack all uh, existing models. So uh -huh. there was a, a guy in Canada who was tinkering around um, soda cans and um, how to use them as a heater. And that, so I took his design and altered it a little bit. Uh -huh. But as I just explained, this design wasn't good enough for the people who actually need it. So the material, the, the um, uh, yeah, the design just didn't stand up to the to the mater material. to the materials they had. Yeah, they needed something that draws a lot more air, and mm -hmm. it would also work with damp or wet materials. Yeah, very cool. Can you talk about the other other things that you've done? Sure. Um, um, so one of the major issues homeless people have is that when they build a shelter, it usually gets destroyed by the police. The police destroyed it? Yes, wow. because 
when uh, wherever you have homeless people, the market value of the apartments surrounding them is dropping. So the, the owners put pressure on the council and the council then uses the police to kick out the homeless people. It's legal to have the police kick out, uh, destroy their shelters? Uh, yeah, because it's illegal to have permanent shelters uh, if you don't have a permit. Mm -hmm. And so what's usually happening is that they sleep on the street with their makeshift sh shelter and then the police comes and they destroy all the shelter mm -hmm. and they don't just destroy it but they take all their pro uh, property and throw it away to discourage them to do something foolish like building a shelter for themselves in the future. You cannot uh, use the tents like campers? Uh, it's, it's unaffordable for them. It's unaffordable. So um, the design behind me basically allows them to use uh, old wood and uh, advertisement um, posters mm -hmm. in a way that they basically can just wrap it up as soon as the police comes and I'll, I'll add it like a little wheel on top. So even if they're like older people, they're not very strong, they can just wrap it up and just hold up one side and use the wheel to mm -hmm. just get away quickly. As well as uh, through the work you have done with the uh, modular table design, yep. I hope to maybe produce some more and distribute them as well to the um, uh, people that live in the cage apartment and to the homeless people because for them having something that is foldable, easily storable is as important as it is for people uh, living in the cage apartments. Okay. Wow, a lot. So you've done all this in how much time? Uh, two weeks. Two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> but like, I, it's uh, it's really frustrating for me because um, uh, I would love to stay longer, get, um, uh, living here and, and working with you and um, the people of the Maker Bay. I realize that there's so much potential, mm. and um, working with the homeless people and the refugee, I realize that the need is so big and so diverse mm. that. Um, even though these products are kind of cool and gimmicky, mm -hmm. it just touches the surface of the actual needs. Mm -hmm. And if you don't work with, if you don't build with the community, you just build something and you give it to them, that is uh, the wrong form of charity. Mm -hmm. So the best way is actually building a personal relationship with the community mm -hmm. and build products with them in a way that they believe they invented it mm -hmm. or they just contributed like, to it. Yeah, contributed to it. And that will allow the community to embrace a product as a native Hong Kong product, not something that's been brought to them by some white guy. And so, um, why are you not part of a big uh, NGO and you know looking for? Why are you an independent? Uh, I don't. Are you a designer? Are you a humanitarian aid worker? Why mm -hmm. are you independent? Why? I, I work with a lot of NGOs and I uh, got really, really frustrated about how inefficient they work, how they spend a lot of money of buying new goods, bringing uh, very expensive consultants abroad that advises them on how to do very unsustainable forms of aid, where traditionally if the money runs out in a project, the, the impact reduces to zero. Mm -hmm. and. Um, I hope that through the approach of using local resources that are freely available and working with the local community to build solutions through them and by them, mm -hmm. you have a sustainable uh, project. Mm -hmm. So I try to um, engage with NGOs as an outsider and try to convince them to improve their approach, which is something I found un impossible to do working within NGOs because you basically have to reach decision makers, not just people who kind of Do work on the middle level. Yeah. And so um, working on such a scheme, looking at the waste as a new form of resource and transforming into habitat, into heating, into environment, uh, do you see this as a first step into reintegration of, of uh, the, say the middle class of the society? Or you think that we're, you would be creating an, a new type of uh, uh, strata and just making them more sustainable. Is the goal to make this uh, base of the pyramid viable or is your idea is to bring them up the, the, the social, social scale? I think it's, um, it, it can be seen in both ways. On one hand, if you embrace certain products and you specialize in their production, you can make a living and you might be able to climb the pyramid. Uh -huh. 
but first and foremost it's to help them with their immediate problems and to relieve some form of stress mm -hmm. or to um, satisfy some form of need mm -hmm. in a very immediate way which then gives them free time or gives them some form of comfort mm -hmm. which allows them to focus up on their self-empowerment. Mm -hmm. So say um, if you have a homeless person and they they have access to uh, to your to your technological inputs. They are co-inventors. Uh, what is your your dream scenario? Is that they, they access this kind of early technology, and then what happens to them next? So they have more time to, for example, go to school. Or so can you can you explain what's what's the story you have in mind? Sure. Um, so there are there are two possible scenarios. One scenario is, for example, the project I've done in India, where I produced a, a water heater with the local community that now allows them to heat water in a more safe and, and efficient way. Mm -hmm. This empowers the community to have um, a he healthier um, uh, life and also allows them to make some money. Whereas here. I really envision that um, given the, the, the very steep ladder and the very steep pyramid that exists in Hong Kong, it's actually quite difficult to make enough money to climb up the next step of the social strata. Here I see it more like a do-it-yourself gimmick that might be passed along from one homeless person to the next homeless person. Mm. I see. So uh, Hong Kong is one of the most inequal societies in the world. You have the, the second uh, highest concentration of a millionaire, and at the same time you have uh, about 25%. Of, well, there's a large number of, of uh, old people, for example, that live in actually uh, under the yes. poverty uh, man. And so how do you explain that? And why do you think, I mean, what do you think is going to happen to a society in which uh, extremes are stretching apart? It's... Um This is a really difficult question. I think that if you look at other cases, like for example some cities in Brazil, where you have a similar uh, distribution, um, you have um, um, you have an unequal system that becomes more and more, uh, more unequal. Mm -hmm. So I can't think of a historical example where these kind of gaps grew closer in a kind of natural, steady way, mm -hmm. but they become so wide that they're, uh, the only way to kind of uh, keep on the status quo is to build more walls, to create more security, mm -hmm. in, in order to guarantee that the rich become richer and the poor stay poor. Mm -hmm. However, I hope that um, Hong Kong will take, away, uh, will take a route where uh, innovation and um, the access to knowledge mm -hmm. allows more and more people to climb up out of poverty mm -hmm. and it creates a more equal society mm -hmm. that is not, you know, ruled by very, very rich elite that is not legitimate. Mm -hmm. If you ask to uh, certain anthropologists in Hong Kong, uh, they would tell you that uh, the fact that Hong Kong has a lot of poor people is itself the engine of Hong Kong prosperity, that rich people need the existence of the ultra poor. Sure in order to fuel the economy and to have the low-cost personnel. Yes. And, um, and so um, I'm just wondering how, how we can contribute to reduce that gap if, that's the, if the society in general is stretching those two extremes. Yes. I mean, this is, I, I think this is what you do here at the Maker Bay, where you give people the opportunity to become self-sufficient, mm -hmm. where in order to access shelter, uh, electricity or any type of good mm -hmm. is something that you can provide for yourself you just make it yourself you don't mm -hmm. have to go out and spend money which basically relieves some uh, economic pressure from the society so the the best way forward is exactly what you do here at Maker Bay you mm -hmm. create a, a space for people to empower themselves using materials and the tools that you provide to them. Mm. so you're going to keep traveling I understand. I hope, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and so, um, how do you, I mean, how do you choose your destination and what is your next destination and why will you be going there? Sure. Um, uh, so, I, um, I choose my destination according to uh, where I have uh, the opportunity to work, given the financial restraints I'm under 
I can just really work where uh, people provide the platform for me to work. Mm -hmm. This is why I'm eternally grateful for Maker Bay to allow <laughs> me to work here. Um, so following um, uh, my stay in Hong Kong, I then go to, um, to India to uh, uh, check up on the water heater project mm -hmm. I've done there uh, one and a half years ago. And um, following India, I will go back to, uh, to Jordan. Um, Jordan is a very um, interesting country which has a lot of stress with regard to the conflicts that surround it and the resulting refugees that stream into the country. Mm. I had the opportunity to go there uh, one and a half, uh, one year ago to, um, to work in a refugee camp, to analyze the camp, what type of rubbish is available, what type of uh, needs are there. And I created an approach about how you could marriage them. So I'm in the process of raising funds to go to Jordan and work there for six months in order to build products with the community mm -hmm. that help them, which will result in a product catalog uh, where NGOs or people who want to do charity all over the world world just have to look in the community what are their needs what resources do they have and then they can use the catalog in order to find an, an innovative solution to these problems that's wonderful and so um so you you made clear at the beginning that uh, there's a big difference in how you work almost as an individual ngo like you're only one person but you're kind of an ngo of, of your own and so uh is it uh, something that you think is replicable do you think we could do generate more george and type of absolutely. people. Absolutely. Yeah, 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 absolutely. It's just a matter of um, of um, convincing people that the status quo is unsustainable, mm -hmm. and we have to experiment and find different ways of mm -hmm. of helping people. Mm -hmm. And the best way is not to create an organization that spends a lot of money on administrative costs, but mm -hmm. the best way is to send out people into the world and let them experiment in very different ways about how to empower people mm -hmm. that are, yeah, that is as far as, as possible from the current status quo, which is very in, uh, unsustainable and creates more dependency instead of people that, you know, empower themselves. But uh, to be uh, a person like you are, you're like, in a, you're like a humanitarian mercenary almost. You're like, you're going... <laughs> <So kind>. <laughs> 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 so like, uh, you go, there's an opportunity and a need and you can... But uh, that, requ that requires a lot of bolts. And, uh, or, 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 or how do you... What, what kind of quality does a person need to have mm. to be uh, George? So, like, person are going to be watching this video and they're like, wow, this is so cool. Like, I, I want to have his balls and I want to go in these countries and Jordan just by myself and, like, help people. Like, where do you find a resource in you to, sure. uh, to do that? The, um, <clears throat> I think this is just that, um, even though mm. I, I'm, like, the main guy in, in the organization, it's not really me who does the work. I try to facilitate it. So wherever yeah. I go, I find supporters, people that believe in me mm -hmm. and that support my project. Otherwise, I wouldn't go in the first place. Mm -hmm. So my biggest advice for people is that the only thing you need to do is go out and ask for help. So you go to provide help, but you ask for help. Absolutely, because um, uh, you don't go somewhere and you say, I know what's best for people. And then you just force it up on people. You go to a place, you ask, can I come? You ask, who might be interested in helping me? Mm -hmm. Are there people already who do something familiar? People mm -hmm. who think outside the box. Mm -hmm. and, and by asking for help as somebody who wants to provide help, you get actual access to the community and, and, and materials that you need to work with. Mm -hmm. So to see yourself as somebody that is kind of removed from the community, that goes into the community, is I think the wrong approach. You are part of a global civil society mm -hmm. and, and you have to take advantage of this global civil society because mm -hmm. you don't know how to do a specific aspect of your work. Yeah. And by just asking over and over for people to help you, you will, you will become an army, not a mercenary. That's beautiful. Um, I think a lot of people who, are, who wish that they, they were doing what you're doing, I think a lot of people would, would want to have this courage. But a lot of people are afraid that if they go so much to help, but they also ask for help, they're afraid to become a burden 
to the people they yeah, want to help. Absolutely, and this is uh, so important that you have this fear. Yeah. <laughs> like nothing is worse than going somewhere and actually use more resources than you provide. Yeah. And, and this should be at, mm -hmm. at the forefront of everything you do. Mm -hmm. And there is no easy answer to circumvent that. So yeah. how, how do you not become a burden? Uh, so Because I think like what I want is that mm -hmm. people see the video and they go like, this guy has the boss to do it. And he said openly that he is calling for help. So how do you not become a burden? So does it mean that when you're going there, you're bringing your own water? And your own like tablets, and you're like a Superman, and, and uh, how do you how do you not become a burden to sure. the community you're trying to help? Um, the the best way is that <clears throat> you, whenever you receive help, or whenever you approach somebody, you are very determined to share. Mm -hmm. So you don't give; it's an exchange. Mm -hmm. So when I came here, I I really hope to help make a bay become bigger and better and attract more people mm -hmm. and in return I received a lot of advice and, mm -hmm. and, and the access to this ama amazing resource and mm -hmm. this is kind of how I do it wherever I go that I always swap I don't when I went to the homeless people with the heater I was aware that it's not a good design so I went there and asked how can I make this better to serve you? Mm. So they showed me about how to actually do a proper heater out of a soda can. Yes, yes. In, a, in exchange, they got a, the, uh, quite a lot of heater, soda can heaters with exactly the design they require. So this that you're talking about right now, to me, is even more precious than the catalog you're talking about, is the method. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, so, okay, so uh, now that you're starting to reveal it, can you go a little bit more in depth? Do you have a systematic way? Sure. Uh, so what is it? So there is um, um, <coughs> so there is a, a course of the uh, MIT, which is called uh, Human Centered Design, mm -hmm. and uh, this course, together with an organization called Ideo, they set up a catalog about how you engage with the community and really find out what their problems are. Mm -hmm. in, a, in a very diverse way. So I use this catalog in order to engage with the community mm -hmm. and to really understand what are their problems. Mm -hmm. I don't, obviously I don't go there myself because I can't speak the language. Yeah. So I uh, engage with a lot of uh, organizations and universities mm -hmm. and people from the community who do this work. So they when they go out and they do their research, mm -hmm. I'm the one analyzing then their research, but before I do that, I make them very conscious about what it means to be a researcher, mm -hmm. not just somebody who asks a question with a specific narrative in mm -hmm. mind, but somebody who is nearly like an anthropologist or like a, a, a scientist that doesn't have any prejudices. Mm -hmm. And the, um, the most interesting part of this research is always the taboo. It's always exactly what they don't want to talk about. It's exactly the problem that they are so ashamed of that they would never share it with an outsider like me. Mm -hmm. Because in tackling this kind of issues, you, um, you have a much stronger impact. Mm -hmm. So once this research is done, I compile it in a, in a quite academic research report, mm -hmm. which uh, for example entails, um, I ask the researchers to take pictures of each problem or each solution they found. Then I filter these uh, pictures and create uh, geotech maps that allows me to see, okay, this, this problem might be more prevalent in this part of the community, mm -hmm. geographic part of the community, mm -hmm. or this solution is implemented in this part, but not in this part, and that allows me to ask more critical questions, and I create um, uh, word clouds from the quantitative part of the questionnaire that people ask in order to see what issue is most prevalent for people mm. because you should never try to solve a problem that is not being perceived as a problem by the community yeah. itself. Yeah. And then I create a lot of mind maps to, to understand the relationship of the problems because you don't want to cure a symptom, mm. right? You want to cure a core the problem. Root, root cause. Exactly, a root cause. Um, so the, and, and in doing so, you create a relationship with the community. 
-hmm. So you go there so often, you ask the same questions all over again, mm -hmm. that people naturally become curious. Like, mm -hmm. why do you really want to know that? And through this process, you identify specific stakeholders in the community. Mm -hmm. Somebody who might be the father figure or mother figure of the community. Mm -hmm. You identify who is the most vulnerable within the community. This, uh, this uh, analysis of the stakeholder and the combination of the analysis of the problems allows you to do the, uh, um, the implementation of a specific design mm -hmm. where you gather all these stakeholders together yeah. and work with them in tackling one, two or three specific problems. Mm -hmm and you provide them with the, with the free materials. So you basically dump a whole pile of rubbish in front of them yeah. and you ask them, so how are we gonna solve shelter using these resources? Mm -hmm. and, um, and then you try to nudge them towards a specific type of solution mm -hmm. and they will, they will follow your lead partially and then they will resist and this is something you, where there is no methodology anymore, <laughs> basically. <laughs> and then they come up with something You have to that use the seduction and threats and <laughs> dates and bananas and chocolate. Yeah, exactly. And then they come up with something absolutely amazing, something that's better than you even thought might be the solution. And then you're done. Because then they, they basically, they take it and they run with it because it's not your baby anymore. Mm -hmm. They put all the effort, all the th sweat into this In process. Place. Exactly. Bye, George. Kind of. Go away. And this is Regardless of solution. Exactly. And Go back to Germany. And, <laughs> and, this is, and this is sustainable development. Okay. Because you actually have people protecting a solution for themselves where you are actually perceived as somebody who's not needed anymore. Mm -hmm. And this is for uh, somebody who, who tries to provide aid or development. It's, it's the great. biggest compliment. Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay, so... Um, what is the favorite way for you to work? Do you like people to send an email and say, hey, uh, I'm in Syria and I'm in a camp and uh, people are dying because there's no shelter and no water. Do you like the, to receive this kind of emails or do you prefer, hey, we are a big nonprofit and we're struggling to deploy into a new place. Uh, can we send you there? Or do you like people send you, hey, I'm a homeless guy and I've seen you doing this and uh, can you provide you money? Well, I mean, uh, you want people to uh, reach out to you. You are like a service. So, so, so how do people reach out to you? And uh, what are the conditions necessary for you to be able to go in these places and, and do your work? What, what do you need from them? What can you provide them? I, uh, I, pro I need honesty. I need to know exactly what their angle is mm -hmm. in this. So I, have, I receive sometimes emails from people that are in these situations and I just give them designs. Yeah. Because there is no need for me to be there whatsoever. Impressive. Um, on the other hand, if uh, there are organizations that are interested in my work. I am very, very critical because I made a lot of negative experiences with big NGOs and small NGOs about why they might be interested in this type of work. So if you are interested in these type of solutions because it's good for the next fun fundraising round, then this is absolutely fine as long as you're transparent with me. Mm -hmm. So yeah, please reach out, send me uh, a very honest email, um, uh, go on my website innovationa.co and, and, and all the resources I gathered, all the methodology I've collected, you will find there. So if there is something I can do in person, just invite me to come, give me a mattress, maybe a couch and a couple of tools and I'll be happy to work with you as long as you provide full transparency. Thanks so much, George. Oh, thank you. Well, uh, <laughs> I can't <laughs> thank you enough. <laughs> it's been amazing to have you as a micro residence for our Makabel program, and, uh, and we hope that we can continue to work if you think that uh, Hong Kong has a lot of relevant work for you to do, and we'd be very happy to support you in those uh, endeavors. And, uh, yeah, so... I, I can't thank you enough, and I would encourage everybody, anybody who might consider applying to this uh, program to do so, because... Um, when I approached you, I literally sent you an email and asked for your help. And mm -hmm. there is no there is no right or wrong way of doing it. Just just do it.